Thank you, Rachel, and good evening. Uh, it's good to be here, all of you, and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, it's a nice afternoon in New York, nice early evening in New York City. Um, and the fact that you're here uh, is a good uh, encouragement for all of us. I even have colleagues from the American Society here <laughs> in the back. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers and the New York uh, University Cancer Institute for inviting me. Uh, I'd like to talk briefly uh, about uh, statistics and risk and other measures that we use to uh, track cancer. Um, the presentation that I'm going to have is going to be a little bit repetitive in some aspect with what Richard presented, but I think it's worth uh, repeating some of the things because <clears throat> sometimes it's difficult to grasp these issues uh, uh, at, at first. So I just want to highlight for you that in your packets you have a copy of Cancer Facts and Figures 2012. Uh, so please uh, use that when you get home to read about the uh, statistics of cancer in the US. Uh, we also have more publications like this one, Cancer Prevention and Early Detection, Facts and Figures 2012, that are available through our website, cancer.org. Um, so I encourage you to use our website for uh, credible information, scientifically based information, uh, to sort out through the cacophony of information that comes every day in the media. Uh, on, on diseases and, and cancer in particular. So, you know, the question is, why do we use numbers and why do you use the statistics? It's a basic question. So basically we use them because they allow us to understand who is at risk for cancer. They al allow us to track cancer in a more tangible way. So Richard spoke about incidence, prevalence, and mortality. Again, going over this, incidence, new cases, Prevalence is existing cases of the disease, which includes the new one, the new cases, and the old cases. And finally, mortality, uh, death due to uh, specific disease. So, you know, also understanding your own personal uh, risk helps you uh, receive appropriate medical exams or screening tests, uh, and also allows you to make lifestyle changes or changes in your uh, behavior or uh, habits that allow you to reduce uh, your own risk of developing cancer. So what is risk is a basic question. What is risk? So I, here is the definition. is the estimated chance of getting a disease during a certain period, let's say next 10 years, or during your lifetime. For example, a man's risk of develop, developing prostate cancer is about 17% during his lifetime, 17%. So the other term that you hear often is risk factor. What is the risk factor? It's anything that affects your chances of getting cancer in this case. That's a risk factor for cancer. Smoking, for example, is a risk factor for cancer because it increases the chances that you're going to develop cancer sometime down the road. Now, different cancers have different risk factors. I already spoke about smoking. Uh, Richard spoke about overweight as a risk factor for uh, cancers also, uh, colorectal cancer in particular. Uh, and we already mentioned uh, family history, uh, either because of uh, genetic uh, issues in which that cannot be changed, that risk factor. However, smoking is a risk factor that you can change. Overweight or lack of physical activity, for example, is something that you can change with some effort. So there are risk factors that are changeable or modifiable, and risk factors that you cannot change, like your age, for example. Age is a risk factor for cancer, and uh, you cannot we cannot change that. I wish I could change mine. <laughs> By the way, I became 60 last week. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, again, simply going over uh, incidence, new cases in a time period, and mortality death in a time period. So uh, incident rate, this is what the repetition is, but I think it's worth repeating. It's the number of new cancers a specific type of cancer in a population. Again, it could be the city of New York, it could be the state of New York, or the US, or, or the world as a whole. And it's usually expressed as a, a number of cancers per 100,000. Uh, and you calculate that by looking at the number of new cancers, dividing that by the size of the population. For example, in New York City, if you have, uh, let's say, 1,000 cases, you divide that number of cases by the population of New York City, roughly 8 million, 
and then multiply that by 100,000. That's how you come up with an incidence rate of a given cancer for a place like New York City. Mortality rate, uh, again, is the number of deaths uh, due to cancer in a specific population in a given year. Again, using the case of New York City, for example, there will be a number of cancer deaths, specific cancer, or all cancers, depending on what you're talking about, divided by the population of the city, a million multiplied by 100,000. That's how mortality rate is uh, calculated. From the book that you have in your packet, this is the estimated number of new cases and deaths for the US in 2012. Now, how does the American Cancer Society come up with these numbers uh, since the year 2012 is barely beginning? Well, we look at a range of uh, uh, years in the past, probably 15, 20 years, and look at, uh, extrapolate for those numbers to come up with an estimate of what number of cases, new cases you're gonna have among males and females and the estimated number of deaths uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the US. So just quickly, if you look, um, estimated new cases among males, you're gonna have more cases of prostate than anything else, followed by lung and bronchus, and third, colon and rectum. On female, first it would be breast, followed by lung and bronchus, and, lack, uh, and third, colon and rectum. So colorectal cancer, uh, third in both cases, uh, second lung and bronchus. Now that's new cases, that would be, uh, you can calculate the incidence uh, in 2012 of those cases. And then in terms of death, uh, the lead one will be lung and bronchus in both uh, genders, male and female. Uh, generally lung cancer when they are diagnosed is usually more advanced uh, and mortality is higher. Second prostate among male and uh, breast among females, third uh, colorectal cancer on uh, the same on uh, both genders. So that's basically uh, a, a quick overview of what are the most frequent cancers in terms of new cases every year and, and cancers, that, uh, cancers that cause more death uh, in a given year in the U.S. Now, but we are making significant progress in reducing mortality. Richard was alluding on how we have uh, fewer deaths in the U.S. compared to other countries. And here you see this, uh, these uh, lines in the chart. This on, the, on, the, on the vertical axis here is rate per 100,000. Uh, these are cancer death rates by sex from 1975 to 2008. Uh, and this is for both sexes. You see that there was a decline roughly around 1990 among men. Uh, and the decline uh, is continued. The decline, uh, the decline is continuing. Among women, it's plateauing a little bit here, and it's beginning to decrease. In general, in both sexes, cancer death rates are declining in the U.S. This is despite, despite the fact that we are becoming a older uh, country, older age country. We have more and more uh, people of increasing age because quality of life, quality of uh, health care, etc. We are living longer. Uh, and aging as a society. And, and as I said before, age is a factor for, uh, risk factor for cancer. So this is cancer death rate among men. Again, from 1930 to 2008, and I just want you to show you that the main declines began around 1990, and it was mainly fueled by the declines in lung and bronchus as a result of declining smoking among men in the U.S. Now, this, this decline is also uh, contributing mainly to the uh, declining death rate in general among men, but it's also uh, uh, fed by declining death rate for cancer prostate and declining death rate for colon, colorectal cancer among men. And I want to highlight you, uh, for you also how stomach cancer uh, death rates have been declining since uh, the 1930s presumably because of uh, a better quality in handling food uh, uh, and food um, process, more hygienic nature, et cetera. And among women, uh, again, the declines have been due, you know, lung and bronchus has st is beginning to decline now, but the reason of this delay between men and women is because uh, um, um, male were, uh, the decline of smoking began among males first. Uh, and second among women. But you have declining in colorectal cancer 
a continued decline in color, and I'm sorry, yeah, colorectal cancer, uh, breast cancer declining, uh, and and uh, uterus has been declining. So, these cancers are contributing mostly to the decline of death uh, rates among uh, women in the U.S. Uh, well, there are uh, different factors. I cannot speak about a single factor that we can talk more about that uh, later. Thank you. So let me introduce also the term survival, uh, uh, which refers to the proportion of patients alive at some point after the diagnosis of cancer. For example, in 2008, for all ages, uh, breast cancer, five-year survival, was 90.5% for whites and 17.8% for African American, meaning of 100 women who were diagnosed and treated in 2008, after five years, 90 of them will be alive, or 78 of them if they were African American. So I wanted to show you here uh, the cancer survival by race, because there are disparities in cancer outcomes and, and cancer mortality and survival, I'm sorry, among, among Americans. Of all sites, in five years, this is five-year relative survival rates, 66 for uh, uh, um, uh, white, the white population, 58 for African-American population. In other words, of 100 people with uh, cancer, 66 will be alive after five years and 58 um, in African-Americans. Uh, because there are disparities. I mean, this is not only true for cancer, but for any other condition. Unfortunately, the population have uh, difficult access to health care, uh, difficult living in condition relation to poverty, related to income, uh, related to educational levels. Um, there is a disparity in, in cancer uh, mortality and survival. Uh, again, this goes across most diseases. Um, so anyway, uh, so, so this you interpret any of these numbers that way. Survival of five years. Uh, based on this, uh, this is the type of cancers here, uh, and uh, this would be a difference between the two groups. But, you know, we are making significant progress overall. If you look at this, this is cancer by all sides. Between 75 and uh, 1975 and 1977, the survival, the five-year survival was uh, uh, 49%, 49 out of 100. But in 87, 89, it went to 56, and the year in 2001, 2007, that's about went up to 67. So it varies by, by uh, cancer site. For example, among breast, uh, female breast cancer, 75 survival rate, a five-year survival rate in 75, 77, it went up to 90% uh, in 2001, 2007. We're definitely having better treatment and, and identifying cancers earlier. Uh, look at also the increased survival among colon, colon cancer, 51% uh, um, uh, in 1975 to 1977 compared to 65% now. We haven't made, uh, made uh, more of a difference or impact in survival after pancreatic cancer, uh, 2%. In other words, 100 people diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in um, survive after five years we have moved up to 6%. Why? Because pancreatic cancer is usually diagnosed at advanced, the advanced stage. Prostate, for example, we have gone from 68% survival uh, in 77, 75 to 77 to 100% uh, in 2001, 2007. So we're making uh, progress in survival. Uh, treatment is getting better, and that is reflected in how we have a larger population of cancer survivors in the country. In five years, five years. If you look at 10 years, that could be a difference. Some people are diagnosed even with advanced prostate cancer. Uh, this is, yes, uh, point, point well taken. But remember, these are aggregate numbers. When you look at individual cases, it's a different story. Now, if we have a 10-year survival rate, that will be uh, less than 100, obviously. So I, I want to emphasize that these are survivals for large groups of people. You cannot imply that the survival for a specific individual will be the same because every condition is different. Every person is different. 
the factor of, of his diagnosis or her diagnosis, whether early diagnosis or not, the quality of the treatment, all those things are going to have implications on the survival of a specific individual. Yes. So who's at risk of developing cancer? Anyone can develop cancer. Any of us can develop cancer. But what is known and what is true is that as we age, our risk, our personal risk of developing cancer increases. And the majority of cancers I diagnose in people 55 years or older. So that's where you're gonna, we're going to see uh, most cases of cancer. Uh, age is the main risk factor for cancer. This is the lifetime probability, the probability over the life of, of, of lifetime of an individual of developing cancer for men is, for all sides, is one in two. In other words, men have a 50% chance of developing cancer over the lifetime. And, and here are the chances or the risk of developing prostate cancer is one in six, uh, lung and bronchus is one in 13, uh, and stomach, for example, is one in 91. Uh, it is, uh, so the risk of developing stomach uh, cancer is much, much lower, uh, less than developing prostate, for ex prostate cancer, for example. And among women, the lifetime risk of developing any type of cancer is one in three. It's a lower risk of developing cancer for women compared to men. For breast, it's one in eight and, uh, of the uh, cervix of the uterus uterus is 1 in 147. Again, a range of uh, risk based on uh, cancer site for women, but definitely a lower risk compared to men. So how can we reduce our cancer risk? Again, there are factors that we cannot change. Age, I wish I could change mine or stop mine, but I will continue to increase my risk due to my increasing age. Uh, but if we stop smoking, we don't smoke, that's the main risk factor for cancer, main, main modifiable risk factor for cancer is tobacco, use of tobacco. Now, maintaining a healthy weight, uh, and this in, involves you know, eating a healthy diet, mostly vegetables, reducing red meat consumption, um, and exercising regularly. Uh, those factors contribute to uh, keeping a healthy weight, which again, as Richard mentioned, is a risk factor for cancer. So maintaining a healthy weight, a healthy physical lifestyle, uh, is, uh, is a way to reduce your cancer risk. Alcohol has been, it's also related to cancer, so we need to drink alcohol in moderation, if at all. Protect yourself from the sun, because sun, uh, the sun is a risk factor, important risk factor for cancer of the skin. So uh, it, it is uh, important to use uh, sun blocking or uh, hat or long sleeve, et cetera, to protect from the sun. Infections, there are cancers that are related to viruses. Uh, the most, one of my most known is human papilloma virus, HPV, which is related to cervical cancer uh, and other cancers. Also, the virus that produces hepatitis B and, hepa and the virus that produces hepatitis C are also uh, implicated in cancer of the liver. Uh, and so even though we don't have a vaccine to, prote uh, to protect against hepatitis C, there's an effective vaccine that protects us against hepatitis B. So vaccination against hepatitis B will uh, reduce the risk of developing cancer of the liver, for example. And finally, uh, a very important one is make sure that you have, uh, that you talk to your physician and you get screenings on a timely basis every year. So, you, so uh, the cancers that are amenable to screening and early interventions like colorectal cancer, breast, uh, et cetera, can be identified early uh, and improve the prognosis. So thank you so much. Let me turn it over to uh, Richard for his concluding part. <laughs>